if you look at Genesis, which is the generations of Isis, so we are the Anunnaki, according to the ancient Sumerian text. Osiris, who is considered to be the Sumerian god Enki, fled Mesopotamia to help start a new civilization. See, the thing about Noah and the Ark, though, if you go back to that, that story is very similar to a story that's in the Epic of Gilgamesh. They found, like, just looking at DNA, that all of humanity at one point got wiped out except for, like, one village. Everyone has descended from uh, the same group of about 5,000 people. Picture this, a fertile land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, cradling the dawn of recorded human history. This is where the Sumerians thrived, a civilization that emerged over 5,000 years ago and left an enduring mark on the world. They were one of the first cultures to develop writing, a monumental achievement that changed the course of human history forever. Their story starts with small farming communities, taking advantage of the rich soil deposited by the rivers. But things evolved rapidly. Around 4000 BCE, a city called Uruk started booming, becoming one of the world's first major cities. This period, known as the Uruk period, saw the invention of writing, the rise of impressive architecture, and the expansion of trade networks laying the groundwork for the complex societies that would emerge later. Fast forward a few centuries, and by 2900 BCE, several powerful city-states like Ur, Eridu and Lagash were vying for dominance. Each city had its own unique political structure, religious beliefs and cultural identity. Think of them as independent kingdoms, each with its own way of life. These city-states were the heart and soul of Sumerian civilization. Each one had a central city surrounded by fields, and every aspect of life, from politics and economics to religion and social structure, revolved around this core. The king, or Lugal, was at the top of the pyramid, seen as a divinely chosen leader responsible for the city's well-being. He led the army, ensured justice was served, and oversaw religious ceremonies. Over time, priests also became increasingly influential, reflecting the strong connection between religion and government. Speaking of the economy, the Sumerians were farmers at heart, cultivating grains, legumes and fruits. Their system was like a big redistribution network. People would contribute a portion of their harvest as taxes, and these resources would then be distributed based on social status and needs. Trade was also crucial, allowing them to acquire things like wood and metal that they couldn't find locally. But not everyone was equal in Sumerian society. There was a clear hierarchy, with the king, priests and officials at the top, followed by regular citizens like farmers, artisans and traders. Then came the slaves, mostly captured in wars or forced into servitude due to debt. Religion played a central role in Sumerian life, with each city worshipping its own patron god, believed to protect and bring prosperity. These gods lived in grand temples, which were not just places of worship, but also economic hubs and storehouses. The ziggurat, a massive stepped pyramid, was a distinctive feature, serving as the temple's home and a central point for religious activities. We talked about the rise of Sumerian city-states and how they functioned, but let's zoom in and explore some of the most famous Sumerian cities. Uruk is like the OG of cities. Often considered the world's first true city, it was a hotbed of innovation and power. Imagine massive ziggurats like the Anu ziggurat and the White Temple. Pretty impressive for a civilization that thrived thousands of years ago. Uruk also gets major props for inventing cuneiform writing, forever changing how humans communicated. Another big name is Ur. This city-state was famous for its towering ziggurat of Ur, a testament to their devotion to the moon god Nana. But Ur wasn't just about religion. It was also a bustling hub for trade and military power, Archaeological evidence shows they were wealthy and artistically skilled. Eridu claims the title of one of the oldest Sumerian cities. Steeped in religious significance, it was dedicated to Enki, the god of water, knowledge and creation. Think of it as a major center for early religious practices, as evidenced by the archaeological finds unearthed there. Lagash wasn't just another pretty face, it was known for its artistic and architectural contributions. This city wielded significant religious and political influence, leaving behind a treasure trove of archaeological evidence. 
including sculptures and inscriptions that offer a glimpse into Sumerian culture. So, these are just a few examples of the vibrant and diverse city-states that formed the backbone of Sumerian civilization. Each city had its own unique character and contributions, making them an enduring part of human history. Imagine a world without writing. Now imagine the revolutionary moment when humans first captured their thoughts and stories on a permanent medium. That's exactly what the Sumerians achieved around 3400 BCE with the invention of cuneiform writing. It all started with simple pictures, think emojis, but for ancient Mesopotamia. These pictographs were used on clay tokens to keep track of things like goods and livestock. But over time, these pictures evolved. They became more stylized and eventually transformed into the wedge-shaped symbols we know as cuneiform. While invented by the Sumerians, it was later adapted by other cultures like the Akkadians, Babylonians, and even the Hittites, proving its versatility across languages. So what did people write about with this fancy new writing system? Well, everything from everyday business to epic tales. Cuneiform tablets were used to record economic transactions, track taxes and inventories, and even document the sale of land and livestock. They were basically the spreadsheets and receipts of the ancient world. But cuneiform wasn't just about numbers and practicalities. It was also a powerful tool for storytelling. The Epic of Gilgamesh, a timeless masterpiece exploring themes of friendship, heroism and mortality, is just one example of the rich literary tradition preserved in cuneiform. Poets and hymn writers also used this script to create beautiful works dedicated to their gods and goddesses, offering us a window into their religious beliefs and practices. Cuneiform even played a crucial role in law and order. The Code of Hammurabi, one of the earliest and most complete written legal codes in history, was inscribed in cuneiform. This code established laws governing everything from contracts and property rights to personal conduct, providing a glimpse into the complexities of Babylonian society. Legal disputes and their resolutions were also documented in cuneiform tablets, shedding light on the legal processes of the time. And let's not forget religion. Mythological stories, epic tales and even instructions for religious rituals were all meticulously recorded in cuneiform. These texts not only reveal the fascinating mythology of these ancient civilizations, but also highlight the deep connection between religion and daily life in Mesopotamia. Beyond writing and city life, the Sumerians were also total brainiacs, making significant contributions to astronomy, math and agriculture. These weren't just random discoveries, they had a lasting impact that continues to shape our world today. Let's start with the stars. The Sumerians were among the first to develop a lunar calendar, keeping track of time based on the moon's cycles. This calendar helped them plan their farming, religious festivals and even their daily routines. Think of it as an ancient to-do list synced to the moon. Their calendar had 12 months, but they weren't afraid to add an extra one every now and then to stay in sync with the seasons. The Sumerians were also math whizzes, inventing the sexagesimal system, which is basically a fancy way of saying they used base 60 instead of our usual base 10. This system might seem strange at first, but it actually had advantages, especially for complex calculations. It's the reason we have 60 minutes in an hour and 360 degrees in a circle, both remnants of this ingenious Sumerian invention. Fractions and advanced astronomical calculations also benefited from this system. Speaking of astronomy, the Sumerians were stargazers extraordinaire. They meticulously recorded their observations of the night sky, mapping out constellations, planets and even individual stars. This celestial mapping wasn't just for fun, it helped them navigate, keep track of time, and even understand the universe around them, influencing their religious beliefs and practices. Some historians even believe the ziggurats, those massive temple structures, served as giant observatories. Imagine priests using these high platforms to chart the movements of planets and stars, determining the best times to plant and harvest crops. Now things get a bit more controversial. There's a guy named Zechariah Sitchin who had some interesting but ultimately unproven ideas about the Sumerians and their epic poem, the Enuma Elish. Sitchin believed that Nibiru, a planet mentioned in the poem, wasn't just a symbolic thing, but a real giant planet in our solar system with a super long orbit like 3,600 years long. Based on his interpretation of ancient texts and artwork, he thought this planet's movements might explain some cosmic events described in the Enuma Elish. 
He also argued that the Sumerians had way more advanced knowledge of the cosmos than we previously thought, thanks to some helpful extraterrestrial visitors from Nibiru called the Anunnaki. Sitchin believed these weren't just gods, but actual beings who came to Earth looking for gold and ended up genetically engineering early humans to be their workers. This genetic manipulation, according to Sitchin, explains the rapid development of Sumerian civilization with its fancy writing, impressive architecture and organized government. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. Would it be fair to say that there's an element of a rediscovery of a yes. lost technology from the past? I think it would be fair to say that, yes. Yeah. Have you ever wondered about the legend of King Gilgamesh and the ancient city he ruled? Let's dive into a time machine and head back to around 2700 BCE, right into the heart of Mesopotamian civilization, during what scholars call the early dynastic period. I would prefer to propose, and I have proposed, that what we're looking at is evidence of some kind of transfer of technology, that people came into that area who had other knowledge. This was an era when city-states were popping up all over Mesopotamia, marking some of the earliest complex societies in human history. And right there, in the thick of it, was Gilgamesh, a name that echoes through history not just as a king, but as a figure of myth and epic tales. Gilgamesh's realm was none other than Uruk, a jewel among the Sumerian city-states, nestled in the fertile lands along the Euphrates River in what we now know as modern-day Iraq. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. Picture this, a bustling urban centre alive with the hum of marketplaces, the grandeur of massive temple complexes, and the imposing presence of the legendary Uruk Wall said to be built by Gilgamesh himself. It's, it's interesting that the patterns are geometrical. Someone made it, yeah. and it involved a very large amount of organized labor in order to make it. There had to be the will and the intent in order to do that. Uruk wasn't just any city. It was a beacon of culture, economy, and innovation, credited with many firsts in human civilization, including the invention of cuneiform writing. But what was life like under King Gilgamesh's rule? Imagine a leader who was more than just a man. He was a figure of divine significance, believed to be responsible for the welfare and prosperity of his people. Under his leadership, Uruk flourished, becoming a center for religious devotion, particularly for the worship of Inanna, a major deity in the Sumerian pantheon. Gilgamesh's Uruk was a city that represented the zenith of Sumerian engineering, architecture and social organization, boasting a population that highlighted its status as one of the world's largest cities at the time. During his reign, Gilgamesh would have been the linchpin in the city's governance, overseeing administrative decisions, religious practices and military campaigns to safeguard Uruk's interests. His leadership likely saw the construction of monumental projects that not only enhanced the city's splendor, but also its defenses, ensuring Uruk's prominence in the annals of ancient history. If we're only looking for a mere reflection of ourselves, we could overlook it completely. I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that our ancient ancestors were up to. Diving into the sands of time, the figure of King Gilgamesh stands as a fascinating blend of myth and reality, a character who has intrigued historians and archaeologists alike. While the line between the legendary and the historical is often blurred, there's a handful of archaeological breadcrumbs that lead us back to the possibility of Gilgamesh's actual existence in ancient Mesopotamian civilizations. First off, let's talk about the Sumerian King List. This isn't your average historical document. It's more like a mashup of history and mythology, listing rulers of Sumer and their reign lengths. What's cool about this list is that our guy Gilgamesh makes an appearance. His name popping up among other rulers gives us a hint that maybe, just maybe, he was a real figure who ruled and wasn't just a character in ancient bedtime stories. The fact that there are several versions of this list, found in different places and from various times, shows that keeping track of their leaders was pretty important to the Sumerians, and that Gilgamesh was a significant part of that record. Then there are the inscriptions and artifacts. Imagine finding a tablet or a cylinder seal with Gilgamesh's name carved into it. These bits and pieces don't give us the full picture of his reign, but do suggest he was recognized as a king. 
These items, scattered across ancient Sumerian sites like breadcrumbs, hint at the long-lasting memory of Gilgamesh, underlining his status not just as a myth but as a cultural icon. But here's where it gets tricky. Trying to separate the man from the myth in Gilgamesh's story is like trying to untangle a finely knotted rope. The archaeological evidence we have doesn't lay out his life story or list his achievements in detail. Instead, it teases us with glimpses, leaving us wondering about the reality of his reign. This scarcity of clear-cut historical records makes Gilgamesh an enigmatic figure, shrouded in the mists of time. Despite these challenges, the evidence we do have is precious. It bridges the gap between legend and history, suggesting that Gilgamesh might have been more than just a character in an epic tale. Diving into the ancient world, let's explore one of the oldest stories ever told, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Picture this, clay tablets etched with cuneiform, the very first writing system cooked up by the ingenious Sumerians. This epic isn't just a tale, it's a journey back to the third dynasty of Ur, around 2100 BCE, though its roots stretch back even further through earlier Sumerian poems about our hero Gilgamesh. The story of Gilgamesh came to light in the modern era thanks to 19th century archaeologists rummaging through the ruins of Nineveh's library. Imagine piecing together a jigsaw puzzle of ancient clay fragments, each piece a window into the epic's soul-stirring narrative. Sure, some parts are missing, lost to time, but what remains is a testament to human creativity and spirit. Now onto Gilgamesh himself. This guy was not your average ancient king. Described as two-thirds god and one-third human, he was a force to be reckoned with. His divine lineage gave him superhuman strength and courage, setting him leagues apart from mere mortals and even other mythical heroes. The epic's narrative is a roller coaster of adventures and quests, showcasing Gilgamesh's thirst for glory and eternal fame. Take his trek to the Cedar Forest to defeat Humbaba, for example. It's the stuff of legends, a clear display of his heroism. Yet, it's the death of his friend Enkidu that turns his world upside down, launching him on a quest for immortality and leading him to confront the harsh truth of human mortality. Speaking of Enkidu, his friendship with Gilgamesh is nothing short of transformative. Enkidu, created by the gods from the wild to temper Gilgamesh's arrogance, ends up becoming his soulmate. Their bond is a powerful narrative force, illustrating how deep connections can foster personal growth and lead to profound realizations about life and oneself. At its core, the epic of Gilgamesh is rich with themes that resonate deeply with the human experience. It's a tale of the relentless search for fame and the universal quest for immortality, only to find that death is an inescapable part of life. The story underscores the importance of friendship and how it shapes our journey towards understanding and accepting our humanity. In the whirlwind adventure that is the epic of Gilgamesh, we're treated to some of the most captivating encounters between a mortal and the divine you'll find anywhere in ancient literature. Gilgamesh's quest is not just a tale of heroism and the search for eternal life, it's a deep dive into the complex dance between gods and humans in Mesopotamian culture. Take, for instance, Gilgamesh's meeting with Utnapishtim, the ancient world's version of Noah. Imagine sitting down with someone who survived a world-ending flood, all because a god gave him the heads up to build a boat. This isn't just an incredible survival story, it's a pivotal moment for Gilgamesh. He's on a quest for immortality, and here's Utnapishtim, living proof that the gods can grant such a wish. The story of the Great Flood where the gods decide to reboot humanity but spare Utnapishtim mirrors the power the Anunnaki wield in Mesopotamian myths making life and death decisions over humanity's fate. Gilgamesh's journey is peppered with divine interactions that really make you think about the ancient Mesopotamian view of the cosmos. There's Enkidu, Gilgamesh's partner in crime, who was literally made by a goddess because the gods felt Gilgamesh needed to tone it down a bit. Then there's Ishtar, the goddess of love and war, who doesn't take rejection well. After Gilgamesh turns her down, she sends a celestial bull to Rakshop as payback, and let's not forget about Humbaba, the fearsome guardian of the cedar forest, appointed by the god Enlil. Gilgamesh and Enkidu's battle with Humbaba isn't just an epic fight scene, it's a narrative about human ambition clashing with divine intent. Throughout his quests, Gilgamesh keeps in touch with the sun god Shamash, who's like a divine mentor, offering guidance and support. 
It's fascinating to see this godly figure taking an active interest in Gilgamesh's endeavors. Even Gilgamesh's mom, Ninsen, gets in on the divine action. Though she's more of a minor goddess, her interventions on her son's behalf highlight the intimate relationship between the gods and Gilgamesh, blurring the lines between the celestial and the terrestrial. Heading back into mesmerizing world of ancient Mesopotamia, and you'll encounter the Anunnaki, a group of deities whose stories weave through the heart of Sumerian and Akkadian mythology. These mythologies, among the oldest in human history, share a fascinating pantheon of gods, with the Anunnaki holding a special place. Interestingly, over time, some Anunnaki began to be associated with celestial bodies. This transition highlights their growing significance in Mesopotamian astrology and cosmology, where the movements of stars and planets were seen as divine messages. The identification of certain Anunnaki with the Sun, Moon and Venus, for example, lent these celestial bodies a sacred significance, connecting the dots between the heavens and the divine drama of the gods. Hillary Clinton was talking about the tomb of Gilgamesh. And so if like yeah, you mentioned that. Didn't you say Bush was looking for it too or something? The team found a structure that resembled a tomb, and its description bore a striking resemblance to the tomb of Gilgamesh. Diving into the ancient world of Sumerian mythology brings us face to face with the Anunnaki, a group of deities whose stories are woven into the very fabric of early human culture, religion, and the art of storytelling. Among the oldest mythologies known to us, these narratives offer a window into how the people of ancient Mesopotamia interpreted the cosmos and the societal structures they lived within, influenced by divine forces they believed were at play. The roots of the Anunnaki stretch deep into Sumerian beliefs, tied to the primordial deities An or Anu, the sky god, and Ki or Ninhursag, the earth goddess. This pair exemplifies the Sumerian worldview's inherent duality, and as the boundless heavens above, distant and omnipotent, and Ki representing the earth below, nurturing yet unpredictable. The Anunnaki themselves are often portrayed as the connective thread between the heavens and the earth, serving both as executors of the higher god's will and as direct participants in human affairs. Their realm of influence is vast, encompassing everything from the growth of crops to the establishment of laws and the ordaining of kings, indicating their integral role in shaping the Sumerian civilization. One cannot discuss the Anunnaki without mentioning the Epic of Gilgamesh, an ancient literary masterpiece that not only highlights the adventures of its titular character, a king with divine heritage on a quest for immortality, but also features the Anunnaki as pivotal figures within its narrative. This inclusion underscores the enduring presence of these deities throughout Mesopotamian history, influencing the outcomes of mortal endeavors and the administration of both the natural and supernatural realms. Through this epic, we see the complexity of the relationship between gods and humans, marked by themes of ambition, reverence, and the eternal human quest to understand the divine will. The story of how the epic of Gilgamesh was discovered is as captivating as the epic itself, intertwining with the annals of archaeology, linguistics, and the deep study of ancient cultures. This literary treasure, which sheds light on the life and beliefs of the Sumerians and their descendants, was unearthed in the mid-19th century among the ruins of Nineveh, within the expansive library of the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Present-day Mosul, Iraq, now covers what was once a treasure trove of the ancient world's wisdom, attracting European archaeologists like moths to a flame, all vying to reveal the secrets of the Near East's storied past. A key figure in this tale of discovery is British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard, who in the 1840s excavated the Assyrian city of Nineveh. His findings included a vast collection of clay tablets, inscribed with the cuneiform script, a writing system that dominated ancient Mesopotamia. Hidden among these tablets were pieces of what would later be recognized as the Epic of Gilgamesh. The cornerstone of this discovery was the library of Ashurbanipal, named after the Assyrian king who had a voracious appetite for collecting texts from his empire. His collection, comprising tens of thousands of tablets, covered an astonishing range of subjects from literature to science, most of it inscribed in Akkadian, the era's scholarly language, which had replaced Sumerian as the lingua franca of the empire and the wider region. Unlocking the secrets of these ancient texts hinged on deciphering cuneiform, a breakthrough achieved in the early 19th century. 
Scholars like Sir Henry Rawlinson played significant roles in this endeavor, enabling us to access the wealth of knowledge contained within Ashurbanipal's library and other Mesopotamian sites. Among these treasures was the Epic of Gilgamesh, recounting the exploits of the legendary king of Uruk in his quest for immortality, inscribed across twelve tablets. Each tablet delves into a different adventure or aspect of Gilgamesh's life, compiled in the Babylonian dialect of Akkadian during the Middle Babylonian period, centuries after the original Sumerian stories were told. Further archaeological forays across the Near East have unearthed additional tablets and fragments, shedding more light on the epic's evolution and filling in narrative gaps. When we dive into the ancient stories of gods and kings, like those found in the epic of Gilgamesh and Greek mythology, we're stepping into a world that feels both incredibly distant and surprisingly familiar. The similarities between these tales from different corners of the ancient world open up an intriguing conversation about what these stories might share beneath the surface. It's as if, regardless of the time or place, humans have always been drawn to similar themes and structures to make sense of the world around them. Take, for example, the way both the Anunnaki of Sumerian lore and the Olympian gods of Greek mythology serve as bridges between the celestial and the earthly realms. These deities play a pivotal role in human affairs, guiding, assisting, or sometimes obstructing humans in their quests and daily lives. This dichotomy mirrors the separation between the divine and the mortal, a common motif that reveals our ancestors' attempts to understand and personify the natural and social forces shaping their lives. The character of Gilgamesh, with his semi-divine nature and epic quests, might remind someone of the heroes from Greek myths like Hercules or Perseus. These figures all embark on journeys that test their limits and blur the lines between the human and the divine. The dynamic between the Anunnaki and humans in the Epic of Gilgamesh parallels the interactions between the Olympian gods and mortals in Greek myths. In both pantheons, the gods have a direct impact on the fates of individuals and communities, reflecting the unpredictable nature of life itself. These stories imbue the gods with human-like qualities, embodying the fears, hopes and values of society. Such narratives not only serve to explain the mysteries of the universe, but also to articulate the complex relationship between humanity and the divine. This dialogue between ancient Sumerian and Greek mythologies reveals a shared human instinct to explore and explain our place in the universe. Throughout history, the human fascination with the cosmos has been a unifying thread, linking disparate cultures and epochs in a shared wonder at the night sky. This awe has often manifested in the worship of celestial deities, from the ancient Egyptians who saw the stars as the dwelling place of gods like Isis and Osiris, to the Sumerians who believed in the Anunnaki, gods from the distant planet Nibiru. This belief in starborn deities is not just an ancient curiosity, but forms the backbone of the modern ancient astronaut theory, especially as it relates to the Anunnaki and their supposed origins. Zechariah Sitchin, a major proponent of this theory, based his ideas on his readings of ancient Sumerian cuneiform texts. He posited that the Anunnaki were not mythical beings, but advanced extraterrestrials from Nibiru, a planet with a long elliptical orbit bringing it close to Earth every 3,600 years. Sitchin's interpretations, while not embraced by mainstream scholars, have sparked considerable debate and interest. Central to his theory is the notion that these extraterrestrial visitors came to Earth in search of gold, needed to repair their own planet's atmosphere. But the theory doesn't stop at interplanetary mining operations. It also suggests that the Anunnaki genetically engineered early humans, splicing their own DNA with that of Homo erectus or a similar ancestor, this, according to Sitchin, could explain the rapid emergence of Homo sapiens and the subsequent rise of advanced civilizations like Sumer. Beyond mere genetic manipulation, the theory credits the Anunnaki with teaching humans various technologies and knowledge systems, from agriculture to astronomy, thus accounting for the sudden advancements in early human societies. These ideas, blending ancient myths with speculative science, continue to fascinate and provoke discussion. They tap into our perennial intrigue with the stars and the possibilities they hold, a reminder of humanity's enduring quest to understand our origins and our place in the vastness of the universe. When we talk about Nibiru and its connection to modern astronomy, the conversation often veers into the realm of Planet X, 
a hypothetical planet posited by some astronomers to be lurking beyond Neptune, its gravitational pull possibly influencing the orbits of distant objects in the Kuiper belt. This notion has picked up steam thanks to observations of unusual orbital patterns that hint at the presence of an unseen celestial body. This brings us to the interesting distinction between Planet X and Nibiru. Planet X's hypothesis is grounded in gravitational studies and the observed movements of celestial bodies within our solar system, offering a scientific lens through which anomalies in orbital patterns can be explored. On the flip side, Nibiru's story springs from interpretations of ancient texts rather than direct astronomical observation. Are Planet X and Nibiru in ancient texts the same planet? Amid these discussions, some fascinating theories and speculations emerge, particularly regarding the potential impact of Nibiru's approach on Earth. Proponents of the ancient astronaut theory have posited that such an event could lead to global catastrophes, drawing parallels to historical accounts like the Great Flood. They speculate that these cataclysmic events might be linked to past visits by the Anunnaki, tying ancient mythologies to cosmic phenomena in intriguing ways. This has an interesting similarity between Rand Kul Carlson and his repeating cataclysm theory. This blend of ancient lore and speculative science keeps the dialogue around Nibiru, Planet X and the Anunnaki alive, fueling both skepticism and wonder in our quest to understand the cosmos. He knew a mystery when he saw it and he couldn't explain it. We should be open-minded enough to consider the possibility that some of the answers may sit outside of our current perspective. What do conventional archaeologists say when they're confronted by all of this data? Ever wondered what went on inside those magnificent pyramids of ancient Egypt? Well, buckle up because we're about to delve into the fascinating world of the ancient pyramid texts. These inscriptions carved onto the pyramid walls around 2400 to 2300 BCE are like a window into the hearts and minds of the people who built these incredible structures. These texts weren't just random scribbles, they were meticulously crafted during a pivotal period in Egyptian history, the twilight of the Old Kingdom. This era is famous for the iconic pyramids, those towering tombs for pharaohs. The pyramids themselves are a testament to the Egyptians' architectural genius and their deep understanding of math and engineering. But the pyramid texts are more than just historical footnotes. They're the earliest known religious writings from Egypt, offering a glimpse into the beliefs and practices of this ancient civilization. They're like cultural snapshots, showing how art, architecture and religion were all woven together. The pyramids themselves were seen as the ultimate expression of both religious devotion and the pharaoh's supreme power. Speaking of power, the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom weren't just seen as leaders, they were considered living gods. This concept of divine kingship was the glue that held society together, justifying the pharaoh's absolute authority. The pyramid texts are all about this. They're basically spells and instructions meant to help the pharaoh navigate the afterlife and join the gods, further solidifying the idea of their godlike status. Imagine a society where the pharaoh is at the top of the pyramid, wielding immense power. That's exactly what the old kingdom was like. This centralized system allowed them to mobilize the massive resources and manpower needed to build the pyramids. It also meant the government had a tight grip on things, controlling people and resources to a great extent. But running a complex society like this wasn't a walk in the park. It required a well-oiled bureaucratic machine, and that's what the Egyptians had. This network of officials kept things running smoothly, organizing labor, managing resources, and handling the countless details of daily life. It was a sophisticated system for a sophisticated society. We've talked about the cultural significance of the pyramid texts and the social structure of the Old Kingdom, but how did they manage to pull off such massive building projects? Building a pyramid wasn't like putting together a piece of IKEA furniture. It required serious resources and manpower. Imagine this hauling giant blocks of stone, transporting them for miles, and feeding a whole army of workers for years on end. That's what the Egyptians had to do to build the pyramids. It was a massive undertaking, requiring a well-oiled economic engine. Here's where things get interesting. Contrary to popular belief, the pyramids weren't built by slaves, but by a paid workforce. These workers were likely skilled laborers, artisans, and even seasonal workers, and they were treated pretty well. We found evidence of medical care, food, and even some form of compensation. So how could they afford all this? 
The answer lies in a concept called economic surplus. Basically, they had enough resources left over after taking care of basic needs like food and shelter to invest in these grand projects. This surplus came from their mastery of agriculture thanks to the Nile River's annual floods. These floods enriched the land and allowed them to grow more food than they needed to survive, freeing up people to work on other things like, you guessed it, building pyramids. But the pyramids are more than just piles of stone, they're symbols too. Many believe they represent the rays of the sun, a pathway for the pharaoh's soul to reach the heavens. This symbolism is deeply connected to the pyramid texts, which are filled with references to the sun god Ra. It all goes back to the Egyptians' belief system, where religion, royalty, and the universe were all interconnected. Speaking of connections, the pyramid texts are like the great-grandparents of later Egyptian religious texts. They paved the way for things like the coffin texts and the Book of the Dead. These later texts show how Egyptian beliefs evolved over time, adapting and becoming more accessible to people beyond just the pharaohs. So we've explored the economic engine behind the pyramids and the deeper meaning they hold. But let's not forget the pyramids themselves. They weren't just giant piles of stone. They were meticulously designed and built with a specific purpose in mind. Imagine these pyramids as giant tombs, built to house the bodies and possessions of pharaohs after they passed away. But they weren't just storage units. They were designed to help the pharaoh's soul on its journey to the afterlife. And that's where the pyramid texts come in. These inscriptions were like a guidebook for the pharaoh's soul, offering spells and protection every step of the way. The most famous pyramid containing these texts belongs to Unas, the last ruler of the fifth dynasty. His pyramid, located in Saqqara, was the first to include these inscriptions, paving the way for future pharaohs to follow suit. Think of it like a new trend. Once Unas did it, other pharaohs like Teti, Pepi Bawam, and even Pepi II decided they wanted pyramid texts too. These texts weren't just scribbled on any old piece of papyrus. They were painstakingly carved into the very walls of the pyramids by skilled artisans. Imagine the dedication and precision it took to etch those intricate hieroglyphs into stone. This not only shows the skill of the craftsmen, but also highlights the importance of the texts themselves. They were considered so sacred and valuable that they deserved a permanent and prominent place within the pyramids. Speaking of sacredness, these texts were like the holy scripts of their time. They contained spells, prayers and hymns, all designed to ensure the pharaoh's safe passage to the afterlife and even his transformation into a god. The fact that they were placed inside the pyramids, which were themselves seen as sacred spaces, further emphasizes their importance. But here's the interesting part. Initially, these texts were an exclusive club. Only the pharaohs got to enjoy their benefits, further solidifying their divine status in society. It kind of reflects the hierarchical structure of the time where access to certain religious practices and texts was restricted to the privileged few. However, things eventually changed. Over time, the concepts and spells found in the pyramid texts started to trickle down to the broader Egyptian population. This led to the development of the coffin texts and later the famous Book of the Dead. These later texts mark a turning point, making spells and rituals for the afterlife more accessible, not just for the pharaohs but for regular people too. So the pyramid texts, originally exclusive to the pharaohs, became the seed for a more democratic approach to the afterlife in ancient Egypt. Now, imagine unearthing a piece of history that rewrites what we know about writing. That's exactly what happened in the 1920s when the Kish tablet was discovered in the ancient city of Kish, Mesopotamia. This wasn't just any clay tablet. It was a game changer, offering a glimpse into the very origins of writing and the fascinating society that developed it. Kish was no ordinary town. Located along the Euphrates River, it was a bustling hub of trade, politics and culture, attracting people from far and wide. This melting pot of cultures likely played a key role in the birth of writing, as different people brought their own symbols and ways of record-keeping, eventually leading to the development of proto-cuneiform script. The discovery of the Kish tablet itself is a story of collaboration. Archaeologists from the Field Museum of Natural History, led by Stephen Langdon, joined forces with other experts to uncover the secrets of Kish. Back then, excavation techniques were evolving, becoming more systematic and meticulous, which was crucial for carefully preserving and documenting this historic find. But what's so special about this tablet? 
Well, the writing system on it is like a Rosetta Stone of the ancient world. It's one of the earliest examples of written communication, showcasing the transition from picture-based symbols to the complex wedge-shaped script known as cuneiform. This shift reflects the growing complexity of Sumerian society, as people needed new ways to keep track of things. The creation and use of the Kish tablet also hint at a well-organized society. Imagine a city-state managing resources, governing its people, and even engaging in trade with other regions. Writing wasn't just about leaving messages, it was essential for recording transactions, laws, and important decisions. But the impact of writing goes beyond practicalities. It opened doors for cultural expression and the preservation of knowledge. With writing, the Sumerians could record their myths, laws, and historical events, ensuring they weren't lost to time. This paved the way for the rich literary traditions that flourished in the ancient Near East. The Kish tablet is a reminder that writing wasn't just a random invention. It was a necessity for keeping complex societies running smoothly. It also opened doors for cultural exchange and the preservation of knowledge across generations. This discovery continues to spark debates among scholars, with some questioning whether writing originated independently in Mesopotamia or was influenced by other cultures. The mystery surrounding the exact function and content of the tablet adds to its allure, making it a captivating piece of history that continues to captivate archaeologists and historians alike. Dude, they killed 10% of the population of Earth while he was alive. They had a lot of things going for them. They had strategy, first of all. Mm. They, they had devious, wild strategies. They killed so what? many people that they affected the carbon footprint of human beings on Earth. Driving towards Ordos City in Inner Mongolia, China, you're bound to notice the striking mausoleum of Genghis Khan. Rebuilt in the 1950s to honor the legendary Mongol leader, this traditional Mongol-style complex is a focal point for those who wish to pay their respects to a man whose empire once spanned from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe. Yet, intriguingly, the mausoleum doesn't actually hold Genghis Khan's remains. It's a cenotaph, a monument to someone whose final resting place lies elsewhere. This fact alone adds an air of mystery to the figure of Genghis Khan, a ruler of immense power and reach, yet whose burial site remains a secret to this day. There's like a considerable decrease in the carbon layer on Earth when Genghis Khan was alive. Genghis Khan, born Temujin, came from humble beginnings near the sacred mountain of Burhan Khaldun in what is now Mongolia. His early years were marked by poverty and danger, but these hardships shaped him into the formidable leader he would become. Burkhan Khaldun wasn't just a mountain to him, it was a sanctuary, a place to connect with the sky god Tengri and a hunting ground that provided refuge and solace. It's said that during one of his hunting trips he found such beauty in the view that he wished to be buried there upon his death. The end of Genghis Khan's life came in the summer of 1227, somewhere along the Upper Yellow River. Even in his late 60s, Khan was actively expanding his empire, subduing the Tangut Kingdom. Details about his death are scarce and shrouded in mystery largely due to the Mongolian taboo surrounding illness and death. The secret history of the Mongols, our primary source for his life, is notably silent on the specifics of his passing, leaving us with more questions than answers. Genghis Khan's desire for a humble and unmarked grave, as per his wishes, speaks volumes about his character. Despite his vast empire and unmatched power, he sought simplicity in death, echoing his roots and the itinerant lifestyle of his youth. Let my body die, but let my nation live, he reportedly said, underscoring his vision for Mongolia's enduring legacy over his own memorialization. This blend of humility and mystery makes the story of Genghis Khan's final resting place all the more captivating a testament to a life that, while immensely documented, still holds secrets yet to be uncovered. What's crazy is that that was like one of the superpowers of the world that everyone was terrified of, the Mongol Empire. Mm. The mystery surrounding the death of Genghis Khan is as vast and varied as the empire he once ruled. Over the years, tales about his demise have ranged from the believable to the downright bizarre. An early European emissary to the Mongols once claimed that the Great Khan was struck down by lightning, on the other hand, the famed traveler Marco Polo recounted that an arrow wound to the knee was the cause of Genghis Khan's death. There are darker tales too, suggesting he was poisoned, fell victim to a magic spell from the Tangut King, or met a particularly grim end at the hands of the Tangut Queen. 
Despite these colorful stories, the preparation for his burial was reportedly far less sensational. Genghis Khan's wife, Yesui, is said to have dressed him in a simple white robe, felt boots, and a hat, wrapping his body in a white felt blanket scented with sandalwood and bound with golden straps. The funeral procession that carried him back to Mongolia was marked by a riderless horse bearing his empty saddle, symbolizing the loss of the leader. Yet some versions of the story take a darker turn, detailing how the soldiers accompanying his body on the 40-day journey back to Mongolia left a trail of death in their wake, killing every living being they encountered to protect the secret of the grave's location. It's even said that once Genghis Khan was buried in his unmarked grave, a thousand horsemen rode over the site to obscure it further, after which those horsemen and then the soldiers who killed them were also killed in a chilling sequence of events aimed at ensuring the grave's secrecy. Sound evidence that Genghis Khan's DNA is present in about 16 million men alive today. Among the more poignant tales is the one involving a baby camel buried with the Khan, so its mother would forever mark the location of his grave, ensuring that Genghis Khan's family could always find him. Another story draws parallels with ancient burials, suggesting that a river was diverted to cover his grave, echoing the burials of historical figures like the Sumerian king Gilgamesh and the Visigothic king Alaric. The truth about how Genghis Khan died may forever be shrouded in mystery, with each story adding to the legend of a figure who, even in death, continues to captivate and intrigue. Yet amidst the swirl of claims and counterclaims, there's one intriguing piece of evidence that stands out, the Great Taboo, or Ich Korig. Following Genghis Khan's death, an expansive area around Burkhan Khaldun covering about 93 square miles was declared strictly off-limits, with death as the penalty for trespassers, barring the Khan's family needing to bury another relative. This sacred prohibition could be seen as a diversion, a centuries-old feint to protect the true location of his grave. Entrusted to the Dark Had tribe, Exempt from taxes and military duty in return for their silence, this taboo was fiercely protected until Mongolia's transition to a people's republic in 1924. For centuries, this region remained untouched, a pristine snapshot of the 13th century, undisturbed by human activity, save for the trails left by wild animals. Even the communists, wary of igniting Mongolian nationalism, labeled it a highly restricted area wrapping it in military secrecy, air bases, and artillery ranges. Interestingly, Stalin's obsession with finding Genghis Khan's grave, part of his broader fascination with Asia's great conquerors, led to several unsuccessful expeditions to Burkhan Khaldun. Went on to form this empire that to this day is one of the most frightening forces in the history of humanity. It's said that when Timur's tomb was opened by the Soviets, a curse was unleashed, marking the beginning of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Only after Timur's reburial did the Soviets see a turn in their fortunes at Stalingrad, suggesting perhaps a stroke of luck in not locating Genghis Khan's grave. With the end of communism in Mongolia in the late 1980s, restrictions on the highly restricted area eased drawing foreign archaeologists eager to solve the mystery of Genghis Khan's missing grave. In the early 90s, a Mongolian-Japanese team employing ultrasound technology uncovered over 1,300 burial sites of Mongol nobility in the region, a testament to the enduring fascination and respect for the Khan's legacy. The quest to find Genghis Khan's final resting place continues to captivate the world, a puzzle waiting to be solved in the vast, untouched landscapes of Mongolia. The quest to uncover the final resting place of Genghis Khan has led many to speculate that he might be buried near the lofty peaks of Burkhan Khaldun. Yet, the idea of actually digging into the sacred soil to find out seems unthinkable to many Mongolians. The notion of disturbing their national hero's peace is, to put it mildly, deeply unpopular. In a twist of fate, the protection of this revered site has shifted from the hands of tribal guardians and communist enforcers to an international safeguarding body. The area around Burkhan Khaldun has been embraced by a new guardian, UNESCO. Recognized as a World Heritage Site, the Sacred Mountain and its vast untouched environs now fall under the designation of the Burkhan Khaldun Sacred Mountain and the surrounding Khan Kenti strictly protected area, spanning an impressive 4,740 square miles.
This designation ensures that the mountain, sacred to so many, is preserved from undue human impact. Only worship rituals are permitted on Burkhan Khaldun itself, with all other activities traditionally barred. Finding detailed information about Khan Kenti or even a map of the protected area can be surprisingly challenging. The UNESCO website offers one of the few glimpses into the region, hinting at a deliberate effort to keep this area under wraps. It seems as though there's a collective will, perhaps even echoing the wishes of Genghis Khan himself, to keep the sanctity of this place intact, shrouded in mystery and respect. This approach not only honors the legacy of Mongolia's greatest hero, but also resonates with those who believe that some secrets, some mysteries, are indeed better left untouched and unsolved. Conqueror of empires. In the annals of history, one name stands above all others. Alexander the Great had conquered and created the largest land-based empire the world has ever seen. Picture this. The legendary Alexander the Great, dead at the young age of 32. Instead of leaving clear instructions about his final resting place, he left behind a mystery that has baffled explorers and historians for centuries. His tomb, often referred to as the Holy Grail of archaeology, has been the subject of countless searches, all ending in frustration. So what happened to Alexander's body after his death? The story goes like this. After Alexander passed away in 323 BCE, his powerful friends started fighting over his vast empire, eventually tearing it apart to build their own kingdoms. One of these friends, Ptolemy Sota, wasn't a major player during Alexander's reign, but he eventually gained control of Egypt and established a dynasty that lasted for centuries. Now the details about Alexander's burial wishes are murky. His appointed successor planned to send the body back to Macedon, but it never arrived. Ptolemy, seeing an opportunity, intercepted the body in Syria and redirected it to Egypt. At the time, Ptolemy was ruling from Memphis as Alexandria, the city he would later make famous, was still under construction. This meant Alexander got a temporary tomb near Memphis while his final resting place was being figured out. Fast forward to the 19th century and archaeologists stumble upon a temple dedicated to Pharaoh Nectanebo II near Saqqara, south of Memphis. This pharaoh was the last native ruler of Egypt before the Persians took over in 340 BCE. Some archaeologists, like Andrew Chug, believe this temple might have been Alexander's original temporary tomb in Memphis. Here's why. The temple was relatively new when Ptolemy needed a place to bury Alexander, and it was likely the most recent grand non-Persian building around. Plus, there was even a spare royal sarcophagus that belonged to Nectanebo, it seems like the perfect temporary resting place for a legendary conqueror, right next to the seat of Ptolemy's power. Adding fuel to the fire, archaeologists also found statues dating back to Ptolemy's reign near the temple, suggesting some royal attention was paid to the site. There's even an ancient, far-fetched story claiming Nectanebo was Alexander's father, which might have sprung up due to Alexander's connection to the pharaoh's tomb. The Soma, Alexander's grand tomb, was once a major tourist attraction, drawing visitors from all corners of the world. But then, it vanished without a trace. The last confirmed sighting of the tomb was during a visit by the Roman Emperor Caracalla in 215 CE. He even took some souvenirs but supposedly replaced them with his own gifts. After that, mentions of the tomb and Alexander's body become scarce. There are a few hints, though. A writer named Libanius claims to have seen Alexander's mummy on display around 390 CE. This timeline coincides with the Theodosian decrees, which shut down pagan temples across the Roman Empire. The Soma, being a shrine dedicated to the deified Alexander, likely fell victim to these laws. Saint Cyril of Alexandria even mentions the stripping of treasures from Alexander's cult centers around this time, though the tomb itself isn't explicitly mentioned. Fast forward to the 400 CE, and another writer, St. John Chrysostom, drops a bombshell. Both the body and the tomb are now lost. Finding the tomb is no easy feat. Alexandria is a bustling city today, making large-scale excavations nearly impossible. Plus, there's a chance the tomb was simply destroyed over time, or even swallowed by the shifting sea levels. Another complication. Was Alexander even buried in the Soma in the first place? It wasn't uncommon for bodies to be moved in ancient Egypt. Maybe Alexander was relocated to a secret location, making the search for the Soma itself a bit of a red herring. 
So, the quest for Alexander's tomb is more like a multi-pronged approach. One path involves finding the ancient crossroads of Alexandria, which might offer clues to the Soma's location. Local legends also point to a specific area, but without concrete evidence it's like chasing shadows. The hunt for Alexander's tomb has led treasure hunters and archaeologists on a wild goose chase for centuries, with several contenders emerging along the way. One such contender is the Nibi Daniel Mosque, located just a stone's throw from the suspected location of the ancient crossroads. Back in 1850, a famous archaeologist even tried but failed to get permission to excavate there. While scholars doubt the mosque is the actual tomb, its claim likely stems from a genuine historical memory of the Soma being nearby. Across town, the Atarine Mosque also throws its hat in the ring, having attracted the attention of Napoleon's archaeologists in the 18th century. They didn't find Alexander, but they did stumble upon a repurposed sarcophagus. Guess whose? Nectanebo II, the pharaoh who ruled Egypt before the Persians took over. This discovery is intriguing. How did the Atarine Mosque end up with this specific sarcophagus, and so close to the estimated location of the tomb? It seems like more than just a coincidence. While the Atarine Mosque isn't the Soma itself, the presence of the sarcophagus and its proximity to the suspected location are promising signs. The search, however, doesn't stop in Alexandria. Some have ventured further afield to the Siwa Oasis, where Alexander was declared the son of a god. However, there's no historical evidence to support a tomb there, and recent claims of its discovery have been dismissed by experts as more interested in boosting tourism than historical accuracy. The search for Alexander's tomb takes another unexpected turn, this time heading back to his homeland Macedon. After all, it was originally supposed to be his final resting place. One possibility emerged in 1977 with the discovery of an ancient tomb at Aigai, which is modern-day Vagina, Greece. The excitement was real, fueled by artifacts dating back to Alexander's time. However, the plot twist. The tomb belonged to none other than Alexander's father, Philip II. While not exactly Alexander, it's certainly the closest archaeologists have come, minus the actual conqueror himself. Another hopeful candidate, the Castor tomb discovered in 2012 at Amphipolis, also turned out to be a dead end. No remains of Alexander were found, and the artifacts pointed away from any connection to him. So it seems Egypt remains the front-runner in the tomb hunt. Or does it? Enter archaeologist Andrew Chug with a bold theory. Alexander might be in Venice under the mistaken identity of St. Mark the Evangelist. Hold on, you might be thinking, how can that be? Well, here's the twist. Traditionally, St. Mark, credited with writing the Gospel of Mark, was believed to have been martyred in Alexandria around 60 CE, with his body destroyed by fire. However, a curious twist emerged. A 4th century text claiming otherwise turned out to be a 6th century forgery. Then, in 392 CE, St. Jerome's writings mention St. Mark's body being present in Alexandria. Here's the suspicious part. This miraculous reappearance happens right after the Theodosian decrees forced the closure of pagan temples, including the possible destruction of Alexander's tomb. Coincidence? Maybe, but Alexandria is a big city, but there's more. The supposed tomb of St. Mark lies near the modern St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Cathedral, conveniently situated just 200 meters north of the suspected location of Alexander's tomb. So we have Alexander vanishing around 390 CE, as pagan sites were shutting down. Then, poof, St. Mark's body appears in the same area just two years later, despite centuries of claiming it was destroyed. Chug doesn't stop at just proposing a wild theory. He also offers some intriguing evidence to back it up. He suggests that Alexander's tomb was simply given a makeover during the Theodosian decrees to avoid destruction, transforming into the tomb of St. Mark. Here's where things get even more interesting. Venetian merchants, apparently unaware of the switcheroo, supposedly stole these St. Mark remains in the 9th century, smuggling them out of Alexandria and eventually building a church in Venice to house them, the present-day Basilica di San Marco. The timing and location of these disappearances and reappearances are certainly suggestive, but Chug goes a step further. During renovations of the Basilica in the 1960s, a peculiar piece of stone carving was found. The stone originated from the eastern Mediterranean and depicted imagery strongly linked to Alexander's Macedonian heritage, a shield with his royal house's star and a special spear used by his army. 
Recent analysis suggests this fragment was part of a sarcophagus casing, but its size didn't match any known sarcophagi in the basilica or any Macedonian artifacts. However, it did match one specific sarcophagus perfectly, Nectanebo II's, down to the millimeter. Chug argues that this piece is proof the Venetians unknowingly took a chunk of Alexander's actual tomb when they stole the supposed remains of St. Mark. Intriguing, right? Reviewing the evidence, Chug's theory, while seemingly outlandish, starts to make a surprising amount of sense. It connects several previously puzzling dots in the long search for Alexander's tomb. According to Chug, Alexander was initially buried in Nectanebo II's sarcophagus in Memphis. Then both the body and the sarcophagus were moved to the Soma. The Ptolemies even built a special casing for the sarcophagus to protect it for centuries. The tomb remained undisturbed for over 700 years until the Theodosian decrees forced its transformation into a Christian monument dedicated to St. Mark to escape religious persecution. Alexander's body vanished at the same time and place where St. Mark supposedly appeared, and local memory of Alexander's tomb being nearby persisted despite the fabricated story of St. Mark. Fast forward centuries later, the Venetians, believing they were taking the remains of their patron saint, stole the body and a chunk of the Ptolemaic casing. Back in Alexandria, the empty sarcophagus ended up in the Atarine Mosque, where its connection to Alexander's burial was somehow remembered. So, if Chug's theory holds water, the famous tomb of Alexander the Great might still be buried beneath the streets of Alexandria, roughly where local legends and archaeological studies have pointed all along. However, Alexander himself has likely been gone for over a thousand years, possibly resting, ironically, within the Basilica di San Marco, mistaken for a saint. Unfortunately, confirming this theory would require examining the remains in Venice, something the Catholic Church and the city are unlikely to allow any time soon, leaving the debate unresolved for the foreseeable future.